save this fan. Oh, so good to see you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the West Virginia Archives and History Library. Uh, we have a few uh, lectures coming up in the, in the coming months, and we invite you to take a look at our uh, West Virginia Archives. Uh, our West Virginia, let me get, get my breath here, wbculture.org backslash history, and if you go to our website on the right-hand side of, the, uh, of our page, you'll see where the upcoming lectures and things are. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn the, uh, turn the lecture over to Chlorine Carter here. Thank you. Well, we've been walking around and socializing, and I'll just say hello again. And hi, Gary. Hey, <laughs> we're so happy you arrived. Uh, thank you. And this evening, we're going to have a good time because he's worth waiting for, I'm sure. And if you happen to have seen the newspaper article last Sunday, what more can you say? But the thing is, that's in writing, but we're going to hear it for ourselves from him. And only he can tell the story the way it happened for himself, the way it really was. And we're so happy to have him here. He's a former West Virginian, born in Burns. Burnwell, Burnwell. West Virginia and married with two children, grandchildren, and resides in the D.C. area at this time. We're not even gonna waste a lot of time because I can talk, I used to couldn't, but I can now. And uh, I think you'll want to hear him instead of me. And we're gonna hey, say hello again, Gary, and glad you got here safely. Well, thank you. And you certainly look well in our old age. Yeah. And we want to give you the man of the hour, Mr. Gary Mays, who they call the one-armed bandit. <laughs> well, well, I want to thank you, everyone, for coming out this evening, and uh, I want to thank God that we got here. You know, it was we had three, uh, four car washes that we ran through. Didn't think we were going to get out. Yeah, but it was, uh, I, we came on down. But I, well, the yeah, first thing, my name is Gary, Gary, Gary Mays. I was renamed in high school. And I was born in Burnwell, West Virginia, number one holler, and proud of it. Uh, some fine people out of Number One Holler. I swear, if you lived in Number One Holler and didn't leave, you wouldn't know the world existed and you had everything you wanted right in Number One Holler. Everything. I was raised by my grandmother. My mother left town to get married and her boyfriend lived at Greencastle. And uh, they went to... Uh, Washington and she followed and uh, got married and that was in 1938 and uh, She left me with my grandmother and they were well, and What a wonderful lady. I can never say enough about this lady. She was the Epitome of people she was just it and uh, I lived with her she and my uncles, two uncles, and the other uncles had gone and gotten married, but they, it was two left, and we, they, we lived there. And went, uh, played with these two little boys, three little kids, every day. And we didn't know whether we were black or white. We didn't, it didn't matter. It was a guy named uh, Vincent Burdett, Robert uh, Hudson, and William Hudson, Billy and Boo. And Billy and Boo, we were inseparable. They, they would drink beer together, they'd get beer bottles and they'd drink. They were kids, they loved beer. And <laughs> they, but we uh, played, and I remember the Halloween before uh, 
I got my arm shot off. It was on election day, 1940, November the 5th, 1940. And uh, it, was, it was an accident. It wasn't anything malicious. My uncle went hunting. He borrowed a shotgun from a guy and went hunting with the gun. And uh, it was kind of brand new. He didn't know the gun that well. But he thought he ejected all the shells out. I started playing with it. I was supposed to be on the front porch waiting for Mr. Pence to take my grandmother to vote. And, and when she took to pick my grandmother up to vote, I saw my, Mr. Pence coming up the road, so I had a chance to go on the back porch and see my uncle with these squirrels so I could play with these squirrels and tease my black cat, Billy. So I was out there teasing Billy and the gun uh, some shells fell off of the uh, back porch and went in the drain ditch in the ditch in the back, off the back porch. Rufus Harris ran down the steps and uh, shook the back porch. The gun fell over and shot my arm off. And you know, and mother, grandmother told me when we got back, she uh, said, "Boy, anybody ever talked to me and told me, say, son, you are a child of God." said, the first thing you should know that you're so lucky to be here. Look at all the sperms that didn't make it. I'll never forget this. She said, look at all the sperms that didn't make it. And you made it. You are special. And everybody around you is special. I guess you're, everybody here is special. And, and what did she talk to me? She talked to me about everything. Uh, she talked about values. Values, I thought, uh, I was listening to Clinton's speech, I mean, uh, Obama's speech, a president uh, talking about values. He must have been talking to my grandmother, you know, <laughs> because she, we didn't, values weren't monetary values. She said, these values I'm going to leave with you, you can have the rest of your life, and they will carry you out throughout your life, and they have. And she said, the respect for others and your respect yourself and be courteous and kind to others. And everybody you see, speak to them. I speak to everybody, everybody. And she talked to me about this all. She, she would give me, you know, yeah, run, open that door for that lady. You see her coming, open the door for her, you know? So she taught me all this. but. They was, I was, uh, after I was uh, left by my mother with my grandmother, I wasn't with three or four, three, and uh, four out of five, I knew everybody in Burnwell looked like, you know? And I had, uh, I would go to all the boarding houses. There were two boarding houses, Hel my Aunt Helen, uh, Grand Aunt had a boarding house, and I go there and I would eat, and I come down to the next boarding house and I would eat there. And then I go to Helen's house and I would eat there. Then I'd go across the creek to my to where I was living and eat there. So I had no problem eating. And, and the one one thing that all of them did <clears throat> is they taught manners. They taught manners. And uh, Uncle Clint lived in Sandy City. Ron Nelly married my aunt, and they lived in Sandy City. And uh, he was saying, the first thing he said, did you wash your hands? So I said, Uncle oh, Clint, I don't have but one. He said, well, wash that one then, you know. <laughs> so, so he said, wash your hands. Go out there and wash your hands, boy. So I did, uh, and I came in, and I was standing there eating. I was sitting at the table, and I was eating with my mouth open. So he said, uh, close your mouth when you're chewing. So I said, yes, sir. So OK, he went on about two minutes later. He looked over at me, and I, had my, I was chopping again, he said. And he never had to look at me again. <laughs> So he was the law up there, but it was it was wonderful. Burnwell, Burnwell was wonderful. 
And uh, what was the other question you had? Uh, uh, press the, the questions were in there, grandmother, that y'all wanted me to answer. Oh, but I tell you, my grandmother never treated me differently, nothing. She told me, she said, you got one arm, you, you learn how to do everything with one arm, and the only way you do it and beat everybody else is you do it better, but you have to practice and practice. So that's what I've done. And I have, I have practiced most of my life. I can do anything, anything I feel like doing, I can do. Uh, drive a car, play sports. I, uh, I was in high school and, uh, well, the first thing, I, I left Washington, D.C. in 1947 and I went out for a baseball team I made the team because I made the eighth person on the team. Because the lady didn't pick me. She said, you got one arm, you can't play. So I said, yes, ma'am. But, you know, I got to play because I was the ninth person on the team. And when I went out, uh, I didn't get a hit in fourth inning. Uh, a guy hit a ball to center field. I was the center field and then I went out and played out in center field and she, uh, a ball was hit to me and a guy was on third base. So I threw him out going home. And uh, the guy missed the ball, dropped the ball. Well, I was mad then, you know. But I was played uh, and I started hitting and I was in the newspaper three weeks after I'd come to Washington, D.C. and three pictures in the newspaper. So I was on my way with the ball playing and I would go around the older fellas and just watch and watch. And uh, I uh, saw a guy going to play baseball named Joe Mitchell. And I said, man, can I go with you? And he said, uh, your mother's not going to let you go with me play no ball. You don't know me. So I, so I asked my mother, and she said, yes, Joe. So, yep, I started going to this guy, and I was their bat boy. So I was uh, 12, 13. And these were old men. They played old. They played baseball in the country, sandlot baseball. So um, the left fielder uh, was wobbling around. He said, "What is wrong with this man?" He said, "Went out there. He was drunk. So there wasn't nobody else to play. So they put me out there in, in, in center field and uh, moved moved other center fielders to the left. And uh, I played center field and." Uh, Got three hits that day, so when the guy came back, he uh, he never got to play again. I, he could have been the back boy after that, you know, but but I I really had a wonderful time playing Sandlot baseball. So I was two and I was getting my skills straight, and as a center fielder, and uh, I was out in center field. And this guy, I was, this was in high school, and I'm getting ahead of my story, but I didn't tell you about this guy, how I got to start catching. Uh, I was out in center field, and this guy was, was catching, and he, at this point, Arthur K. threw the ball like a bullet. And, and the umpire was getting knocked, hit in the head, you know, because the guy couldn't catch the ball. He was down like that, and he couldn't catch it. So they called me in from center field and asked me to, uh, we come in and, Gary, come in here and catch. So I went in and they said, you must be crazy, a one-arm catcher. So uh, I uh, caught that year, didn't make an error, and made all high, all city, as the best ball player in the city. And uh, they uh, had a uh, game where they, uh, in 1954, they had a game, all-star game, where it was before integration. And they gave this, uh, this trophy to, they didn't give me the trophy. They gave it to a guy that was in white school. And his name, uh, well, I don't want to call his name, but he, he won the trophy. But I went to college and came back and uh, they had a, had a uh, uh, tryout for the major leagues. Uh, and I was the uh, catcher. I said, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a center fielder. No, you, we want you to catch. And I said, oh, God. It was 10 scouts, 20, 22 scouts there, I think. 
and uh, no behold, I won the uh, I won the uh, thing as MVP of the uh, tribe, but I didn't get signed. Nobody signed me. But yeah, so uh, to make a we were in warm up and to show you how things go. I, <coughs> the guy in second race. I threw the ball so hard the second race he did like that and got hit in the head. And then the guy, so the next time he was throwing around, the guy said, nobody covering second. He said, throw it. So I hit the bag. So the ball hit the, hit the second base. So it, it, all that went well. But man, I hit a home run and threw out the only base runner. And in the newspaper the next day, Gary Mays, uh, most valuable player. Nobody. So what about a, about somebody? Did somebody sign him? No. Nobody signed him. Nothing. So I I was supposed to go with the Globe Trotters, and I turned them down. I, that was we. I'm way ahead of my story now, but I, it was happening that, that year, uh, in '55, and I. Uh, I got letters from them. They sent me a letter asking me what was uh, their what their schedule was, and then they sent me another letter saying, uh, "When are you coming out?" You know. So, but I didn't want, I didn't like that clowning. Man, I look and see a one arm man. Look, I thought about the circus. You know, they say one arm guy playing baseball and and playing basketball. I just I just didn't like it. You know, but. That globe charter, I just had, I turned it down. But see, I played ball with Elgin Baylor, with the Lakers. What happened in high school, we had a, a game that he had, he had scored. When I was in high school, I was the captain of the team. Like I said, I'm back and forth, you know. Uh, but he scored 44 points and 45 in the second game. I was all banged up. I had uh, a broke, uh, fractured toe. I, so I'd gotten well, and the season was over. So they had an all-tournament team, and uh, we played. We we were matched up against Elgin Baylor that night. So everybody was laughing and said, "He's coming out here to whip y'all," you know. So my coach said, "We're gonna play a box in one." I said coach, said, "What is a box in one?" And nobody had ever seen a boxing one. And uh, the boxing one is where the two guards and, and the other, the, everybody paired off man to man. And I said, well, what about, about Baylor? He said, you are the chaser. And I said, what am I supposed to do, coach? He said, when he goes to the, I want you to be so close to him. When he goes to the bathroom, I want you to be with him. So I said, all right. So. The game got down to the end with 25 seconds to go. And um, I look back, everybody was standing around and he had the ball and he came across half court. And he said, it's you and me. And so I know what he was gonna do with that man. He was gonna put me in the basket. With, he was gonna dunk the ball and put me in the basket with it, you know? So uh, he got across half court and he always did his head like that. So when he did his head like that, I took my nub that was full of water, full of sweat, and threw it in his eye, and I, I stole the ball from him and, got, and, and made two points. We beat him 50-47. Uh, so, uh, and uh, he, he'll never forget that. But see, the thing is, uh, you gotta have a little edge on somebody I thought he was kind of nervous of my nub when the game started. So I walked right up to him and stuck my nub on his butt like that and rubbed it. He sure didn't like that. He started swinging and swinging. And I had him. He scored 19 points that night, you know. But uh, he, I had him. But I, I have really had a wonderful life with, with uh, sports and everything. I, Joe Lewis was passing, playing golf one day. He came up there and looked at three innings. And he played. He said, "I can't believe it, son." I said, "Well, I did it." <laughs> I, but Joe, uh, Joe Lewis, and 
I've, I've had many uh, things that happened that were really wonderful. That I remember uh, I played with a team uh, called the uh, Fenton Street Knights, and uh, when you and we played down at the jail, Lorton Jail, the inmates. So uh, the, all the inmates were saying, uh, the guys in Tennessee, they say they're gonna win a lot of cigarettes tonight, today. He said, because they're going to run second, they're going to steal some bases on you, Mays. I said, okay. So the game started, and the fastest guys down there were named Epps and Stanley Ford. They were in jail. <laughs> well, they could not run the law, but they were down there. <laughs> they were. So uh, Epps, uh, Stanley Ford got on. We walked Stanley. And he took off. I knocked him off for second. He was going for second base, and I burned him up. So the crowd got kind of antsy, you know. So uh, Epps was up, and uh, he hit a single, and I was. Uh, I, he got off second base. Got, he got on, and I threw him out. Now they the two fastest guys from D.C., but they in jail, playing with the jail team. But a white guy hit a ball and got a double. So he kept on getting off second base. So I picked him off a second base. And he was leaning, and the shortstop tagged him under his foot. And he was leaning like that. And 20 years later, I had a liquor store. This guy came in my liquor store and did like it out because uh, he laughed about that thing that he got picked off at second base. And the inmates went nuts. And we won the game because we scored two runs in the first inning. But we, they, those guys went out and, and ran bases and just acted up. So uh, we were eating the captain's mess and the captain came in there and told me, he said, don't you ever come down here again and start no riot. <laughs> But it's, it's uh, I've, I've had a wonderful time, but you know, uh, I tell you, when I went to school in Idaho, it was, I, was, I had a scholarship to Tennessee State. The, uh, this guy was, was some kind of a coach. His name was John McLendon. Oh, was he a coach? And I was on the way there. Elton Baylor came home Christmas, he and Warren. And he said, man, why don't you come on back out here and, and finish the season with us? And we, 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 we were undefeated already. I said, why don't you come on? So I came back, came out there. I, I went to Idaho instead of going to Tennessee. It was, uh, I just didn't like the way people were treating people down south. South didn't, it really was not my cup of tea. You know, because I had gotten chased out of the Hopewell, uh, Hopewell Foundry down at uh, Paper Mill, you know, for drinking out the white fountain. You know what fountain was white and black. But it was, it was that timely time of my life. But man, when I got on the train, it's 54 hours from Washington, D.C., to Caldwell, Idaho. Oh, is that a beautiful place. So uh, I was on the train and uh, I got to, we got to Nebraska and this kid was crying. This uh, Nebraska farmer was on vacation and he got on his train and he had this kid and this kid was crying, he was crying like mad. And he said he'd been crying for two days. I don't know what's wrong with him, you know? So the kid got up, I was in the dome liner, and he came over and sat beside me and laid right up on my nub and went to sleep and slept all night. And that guy got up to me and said, you gotta be a child of God. So, Cause Lord, we had that guy, look at him. She said, look, look at him, he's still sleeping. Look, he's, he's still sleeping. I said, yes, yeah, thank God, <laughs> it's wonderful. But I've had a lot of mythical things happen to me. With my arm getting shot off, I could have gotten killed. I had a bullet to go through my car, 
car window. I was riding down a highway and the little girl said, what was that? And if somebody shot a bullet from somewhere, you know, in the field, just got loose and it went right through the car. In front of my face, I said, that was another kind. And I went in a river, you know, out in Idaho, and uh, I was riding with some guys coming back to campus, and he was saying, man, that's Main Street. I said, man, that ain't Main Street, no lights down there. So we went in this river, and uh, the car flipped over. Man, it was some ice, it's in February, and ice was all over the place, man, and he, and he was going the back, and the car was flipping over. His name was Gary Kesterson, and I went back in and got him. I dove back in and got him because his arm was in, in the steering wheel, and uh, he couldn't uh, get it out, and I pulled him out and snatched him up, but I swear I've, I've had some close calls. I had a dump truck to hit me doing 50, and I'm standing still. I've been to steering wheel back in a Lincoln car halfway because I didn't want to go out that back window, you know, and I saw him coming and it tore my rotator cup, but I survived it. But I've been in a car wreck with, with the car turned over three times. I got out the car and turned the car over. And I got witnesses to all this, you know. I've, I've hit a ball, a baseball, maybe 500 feet, and I have witnesses to that. You know, everything that I tell you, I have a witness to. I can maybe can't think of all the things, but I tell you, I had a, I had uh, had a wonderful life. But um, when I say the College of Idaho, and that, and I tell people, that was the most beautiful time of my life. I met an angel when I got off the train. He was a little short guy with ruddy hair, champagne colored hair, this white guy named William B. O'Connor. That guy told me when I got off the, off the train, he said, I got a job for you. And I said, a job doing what? He said, just come see me tomorrow. I got a sporting good store downtown. And I said, well, what you want me to do when I got down there? He said, just ride around with me. Just ride around these schools. And he did, and we had a wonderful time. He took me to ev everywhere he went. Cecil Andrews, who was the Secretary of Interior under Carter, and I used to sit on, I used to go out to their meetings, they used to sit on the stockyards, and, that, and they would be over there and they would be talking so I said, who is that? Mr. Simplot, the richest man in Idaho. They would all be over there talking. And they, they, these, uh, Idaho National Bank president, and <clears throat> I'd go over there and they'd come on over, son, and they would keep right on talking. So uh, I'm working with Pat down the sporting goods. They would take me fishing with them. I didn't want to go fishing. I wanted to go out there and eat up all the, all the sandwiches, you know. So I had a good time with that. So one morning we were going uh, fishing to the Oahe Reservoir in Oregon. And um, I was standing beside this window to the right and uh, all you could see out that window was nothing. We were riding on a rim going down to the reservoir. So it, it looked like it was about a thousand foot drop after I woke up, after I got my senses, and they started talking, and they said, uh, uh, Mr. Jones, yes, I'm, I've been selected the driver, and the driver of this heavenly car. So he said, he said it's, it was terrible how we all died back there. So I'm looking out the window, I just looked out the window, it was, it was three o'clock in the morning. And I looked out the window, and I looked back, and they kept on talking, you know, and they laughed, man. They, we thought, I thought I was dead, you know, <laughs> and they laughed about that thing. They kidded me for years about that, but Cecil Andrews was in that car too, you know. He was something, but man, those people were wonderful to me. 
But Pat took me under his wing, and he told me, he said, son, have you got a girlfriend? I said, Pat, ain't no black girls out here, colored girls out here. He said, some white ones out here, aren't you? I said, yeah. Uh, so two this girl named Ann Simmons asked me to go to the Sadie Hawkins dance. I said, godly. But I don't dance, you know, but I went anyway. But uh, that was, a, she was a nice kid. And she, uh, her father was uh, vice president of Kaiser Aluminum. I, didn't, I found this something like later. And she had big bucks, but she failed out of school. But she uh, lived at 1733 Almond Avenue, Walnut Creek, California. Her telephone number was Yellowstone 72109. <laughs> so I'd gotten back into Washington, D.C. in uh, 1956. And I'd fail out of school and fail out of school. So she said, he, Miss Emmons said, are you going to come out here and marry my daughter? And I said, what? <laughs> and Miss Simmons said, she's crazy. All she do is play those old songs. And they had a baby, can't work no more. <laughs> and I said, no kidding. I said, well, what's wrong with that, Miss Simmons? She said, well, she talk, uh, all she do talk about you. And I got somebody for the marrying, but she talked about marrying you. Are you going to have marry? I said, Miss Simmons, I tell you like it is. I never rode a stagecoach or a covered wagon. And damn, if I'm a pioneer, <laughs> not in 75. So I said, no, I'm not coming out there, no. And uh, I never heard from Ann again. I, she, but she, she asked me, what did you do to her? I said, Miss Simmons. I was nice to her. She was nice to me, and I was nice to her. She said yeah, she wasn't touched. I said, no. I kissed her a couple of times, but no, she wasn't. My, my people didn't send me out here to do no crap like that, you know? <laughs> and so, Ann Simmons was a nice kid, but Pat O'Connor, this guy, they never knew how he captured 3,000 Germans. He was, a, he was a war hero. Pat said he was walking along behind his company, throwing rocks and doing it. All of a sudden, here come these Germans out of the woods. They were hungry, you know. They weren't hard to capture, you know. And he told me the truth story, but they had it written up in the paper about something else, you know. But he was, he was my friend. So when they see Pat and I together, they said, there go. Pat and his son. Pat and he got this little black son. <laughs> but, but Idaho was wonderful to me. But the person who got me to the place where I could mingle and do anything with anybody and anywhere is my grandmother. The values she taught me would never leave me. And I've always lived by these values that she left me, that she's she was a civic lesson, always, always, son. You don't need all that food. You don't need all that. You don't need all that. She was born, uh, her husband died uh, April the 12th, 1916. And her youngest, her eighth child was born October the 16th, 1916. And it was in the middle of a depression. I mean, 1916 wasn't a depression. But she lived, lived, and and my my mother had a baby in 1835, and that was me, in the middle of a depression, and uh, we survived all that. We, uh, I tell you, that Burnwell was a rough place. It, uh, that whole that, that way of life was rough. I know some y'all know y'all know some coal miners, you know. But see, my uncle came, my grandfather came to West Virginia in 1910, and he came from Gretna, Virginia, because there was no work there. And uh, he um, had a load, car, had a uh, coal loading contract. So uh, he was loading coal, but see it takes, you load a ton of coal a day. But he died in, you know, trying to load coal. But my uncle, ran a continuous miner 
that did 10 ton of coal a minute. And that shut down the coal, coal mines. That's why the coal fields are gone, you know? I mean, those, those continuous miners, the coal miners made it all, and they didn't have to have all this store and houses and everything. I go to Burnwell, man, and they burnt the, coal, the store down. And uh, it was a beautiful store, but I mean, that, 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 that real life is uh, something. And I really feel sorry for West Virginia that they didn't, that they couldn't clean the coal or really, you know, the industry is here. But man, that, that, that way of life just went by the wayside, you know. But my uncle, and him, uh, I had an uncle leave West Virginia in 1945. I thought it was the end of the world for me because I was still there and I wasn't learning anything in school. I had a teacher that wouldn't teach me. She wouldn't teach me because my uncle married her sister and wasn't so nice to her, you know? And she took it out on me. I said, oh God, you know? She told me to learn the uh, 50, I think it's 50, how many counties in West Virginia? 58 in. Yeah, she told me to learn 58 uh, counties uh, tomorrow morning. I want you to know that. I want you to give me those 58. I said, my God. But you know, I never did homework. I never, ne I have never done any homework all through high school, college, or nothing. I was always hustling. I always had a hustle. Now, my hustle started when I, when I, when I was uh, in the fourth grade in, uh, in Detroit. I would go around the corner and there was a white guy selling free press papers by the funeral home. And all these people were getting off from work uh, at night and they were buying newspapers and uh he said get that one and get that one so i'd get it man i get a dollar a dollar and a half man that was a whole lot of money and uh i was buying stamps you know war, uh, buying uh, those stamps for the war bonds man i was really hustling and selling newspapers on saturday and uh getting home late i had to park in the play for, uh, I was supposed to be Santa Claus, and the lady said, you ready? So, hey, what, I didn't know the first line, you know? But I, I, I got over, but I just kept on, and when I came back to West Virginia to live with my uncle again, I had to get in coal. I mean, I had to get two buckets of coal, two buckets of water, empty slop jars, and do everything. A little guy, you know? My aunt never went, I had, it's, it's my uncle, was married to this lady, and I don't think she ever went out to that little house had the moon, half moon on it. Yeah, it yeah. But she had worked me, but I tried to uh, fix her. She was uh, something, but you know, I'd fix that oatmeal in the morning, and I'd cook it so hard, you know, I'd get up in the morning and cook my oatmeal before I went to school, and I'd cook it so hard so she had to clean that pan. But <laughs> She got me, she said, empty the slop jar, you know. So she, she would balance that out. So I remember that lady, I took, her to, uh, I took her to the World's Fair. And she would say, uh, yes, I know, I know, I know. I know, I know. I said, Cora, what do you know? I haven't told you anything yet. I said, that car, yes, I know. But I said, we well, got to the World's Fair and she got there in front of the fair. She said, take my picture. And we took a picture. She said, we're ready to go. I said, no, indeed. You're not ready to go. We're going in here and check this out. So she did have a nice time. And she came out and she said something. Yes, I know. I know. I said, damn, Corey, you don't know this. You didn't know because nobody told you anything. So I said something to her. And I said, I want you to say, I said, I wish that I could do something. And, uh, and she would say, yes, I know, I know. I wanted to pray some dookie on her coat and say, do you smell this? And she couldn't smell it. But I really got her when she came to, came to uh, Washington and she knew everything. And she said, uh, I said, Cora, I'm going to buy you some. Your bowel's not moving, right? Said, no. I said, uh, uh, I'm going to buy you some uh, Miller brand, Miller brand. And it's like oatmeal. I said, but you got to use a spoonful in it. 
just a little spoonful, a teaspoon in your oatmeal. Okay? Yes, I know, I know, I know. So she went and put uh, a bowl. She cooked her a bowl of oatmeal, but it, it wasn't oatmeal. It was milligram. God, Lima's from the front door to the back door. <laughs> And I left. I said, your sister clean that up. But I tell you, I, I, I ain't got nothing to do with that. But see, people who do dirty things to you, you know, uh, she was, uh, I'm not your mother. But see, people didn't have, uh, 1935 changed a lot of things with people. They didn't have any kids. They didn't have any dependents. So I was my uncle's dependent. So when I left in 1947, she came to Washington and got my two little brothers, one of them was five and seven, and took them down and she had two dependents then. Then she got her kids from down in uh, Danville, Virginia, her niece and nep her nephew from down there, and they had three dependents, but <coughs> they didn't have any dependents. My uncle was working all, he'd go to work, he never saw him, you know, he worked all the time, but everybody needed a dependent, and they had so they started to pay them taxes, you know. But I, I uh, know my grandmother, she told me some things, but the most prolific things she ever told me was, I want you to be a man, and I want you to be a good man, and I want you to remember, can you do the right thing when nobody's looking? So that that is, uh, that is what my grandmother was all about. She was the truth. I could sit here and tell y'all stories all night, but I mean, I think that that's about enough right now because I do want y'all to buy the book. <laughs> that's some stories in this book. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Yeah. I want to know about that home run you hit down at Cabell Field, yeah. out in Kenora River. Who? I used to play on that field, and I only seen one man that ever put it out in the road. I don't know how you ever got one all the way out in that river. No, I ain't hit none of that river. <laughs> you know, the only person that hit, I hit one over at the railroad tracks, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, them, that wasn't fun. But up in that river, across Kenora Boulevard. Right. No, mm, it, yeah, I, uh, Oh, Harry Lacey hit one up on that, up on that track. Yeah, Harry something. Yeah, but, but in uh, D.C., I played with a guy that was 97 years old, and I was his third baseman, and he owned a liquor wholesale house, and I was selling liquor. He gave me a job selling liquor. I went to work in the liquor wholesale business January the 27th, January the 8th, 1968, and... Uh, I went as a, um, a salesman with an $8,000 guarantee. And uh, I knew nothing about liquor. They sent a man from New York, not from New York, from Philadelphia named Mr. Gerber. He came down and he taught me everything about liquor. And uh, I, I didn't know, so I became a star over there because the guy, they were about to lose a brand and the brand was uh, Ancient Age, and I sold a hundred cases in one day, and they saved the, saved the house. But that's what happened to me when people, people say that uh, you can't do something. I always could, and I always could come through. But this man had this uh, named Milton Kronheim. His father's son was a judge, but he, uh, he, um, had a baseball team and he pitched and he had me playing third base. He said, base, play third base. I'd run around. I'd look at all them about the balls coming down, it looked like bullets, you know. <laughs> so I, I hit a home run up there at 16th and Kennedy Street, which is a playground in the street. And Sam Jones that played with Boston Celtics was up there that day. And uh, Sam saw it and Sam was, with uh, John McLendon in Durham, North Carolina, 
when I made 28 points in the basketball game. And, and that's why uh, McLennan told me, he, he had already told me to come, to come down there. But, I, you know, I think about doing things. I look right back through there and I see a young lady. I tried to get her to go to Howard University. She lived with me, Yvette lived with me. And we went to the football game one night, to Monday night. And all of somebody said, Gary, I saw you and Yvette on television. You know, we were on, we were on uh, midnight. So Yvette said she wanted to go home. So she came back to Charleston. <laughs> so that's my little buddy, Yvette Terry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, this is not part of the program, but I'm making it. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Judge since I was. 10 years old or whatever. But I want to share something with you. He's talked about the accolades he's received as a sports person. He's talked about his entrepreneurship and all of those kind of things. But in the early 2000s, I happened to be in DC at a conference. And I was watching the news that night. And a preschool child had wandered away from the preschool. He was on a major highway, and a one-armed person stopped, rescued the child, took him back to his daycare center, and guess who it was? <laughs> so, he talked about his athletic prowess, he talked about his entrepreneurship, but I feel that that was one of the most wonderful, dynamic things that he could have done. All these people are passing this child on this major highway, and he saved his life, or he saved him from harm. Yeah. So I think we need to clap again for that. Yeah. You know, I, 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 that little boy was uh, autistic, and he was living at uh, Andrews, and he was a runner, and uh, they put him in a new school, and he wasn't in that school. Uh, they didn't know he was lost. I found him before he was lost. But I've saved quite a few people. I've saved, uh, I got a guy that's doing some research for me, and I saved his daddy, you know. When I was went to, in 1955, when I came home, I uh, got a senator to the war shack of Idaho, they were all Republicans, and they all took me under their wing. I used to, Mr. Smith and all of them just came to come to the games, and uh, they got me a job at the recreation department, and I used to swim. And uh, I told the guy, Woody, I said, Woody, see the kids looking, and say they can't swim. You gotta teach them how to swim. Oh, maybe they're scared of the water. And I said, "You look, Woody. I'm going to swim the pool. Now I'm going to swim under, under. I'm going to swim under the water, oh, the length of the pool, and then I'm going to come up halfway. I'm going to do it a length and a half." So I came up. Sure enough, man, them kids started jumping in that pool. Man, he said, "You cussing me?" I, I said, "I told you they were going to start jumping in that pool. I told him what happened, and I started snatching them out." And one of these kids' name was Steve Duttweiler. And his son came to tell me that I saved his daddy's life because he was gone. <laughs> but I uh, have saved a lot, of, a lot of those kids around that pool. But uh, I, 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 just, I didn't tell you all about me. Uh, you know, I went to Howard University. I have two uh, PhDs. You know that, don't you? I have a post hole digger and a <laughs> and a pile high and deeper. <laughs> As my friend up in Marmette would say, old Pat Pole Hollis, he was from Burnwell. Boy, you talking about a fine guy. His I went to his house and uh, an angel came in and it was his granddaughter. And I was getting ready to go, and he, uh, we had been down to Warren's. I've been somewhere down here. But uh, she said, Gary, who are you going to vote for? 
And I said, I don't know. She said, Obama, I couldn't even pronounce his name. And she said, Obama is going to win it. So she was working in North Carolina, so when she told me that, that's when I got, you know, to see who, who Obama was. But that little girl, uh, uh, Raymond Tadpole Hollis, lives in 98th Avenue. And I had to go by and see him tomorrow. He's 87 years old. But he could take his foot and kick the ceiling, kick the uh, door, top of the door, and, and then and, and be on his feet. He, he was something. But he had a ball Saturday nights with us. Man, he, the black neighborhood, he, he didn't know he was white on, on Saturday night. You know, he, he was something, man. He had a ball. He, he's, he's a nice guy. You talking about, see those guys here, um, a guy named Boomy, Boomy Calhoun, his name was Fred Calhoun. He taught us, uh, taught me at uh, Ernest Dew's football. We thought the football field, we didn't know how it was marked off, and he taught us, told us, and told us the, the rules of football. And that's what my grandmother said, if you're going to ever do anything, you've got to learn the rules. If you don't know the rules, how are you going to play the game? So I always learn, learn the rules of the game. And that's, that's how I really succeeded by, see, it's a, it's a funny thing when people think they have the advantage of you. A guy named Drummond, he was running over everybody. He was, he was, uh, 230 pounds, he was about six foot two. And he, were, he would run over you, and uh, he was on a squeeze play, and he was, uh, the guy missed the ball, and I saw him coming down third base, and I hit him and his knees and knocked him off. He was gone. But I, I in my neighborhood, I used to, uh, I was a numerologist. I wrote numbers. <laughs> and. Uh, it was a guy I was working with, you know, and he, uh, he was the backer, and I was the running main runner. And he had a guy that was a boxer named Flaco. And Flaco uh, was, didn't like me too well, so I was running in the restaurant, and he had his foot on the door. I ran all into the door, and man, he laughed. And so I told Mr. Simpson, so he said, I'll talk to him. So when he said he talked to him the next day, he saw me. He hit me with a left and a right, right in that eye. So I had a pocket full of numbers and money, and I was at 1406 North Capitol. So I said, Martina's at the cleaners at 1402. So I said, I started down there to give her my money and, and uh, my numbers so I could come back out here and fight him. So. Uh, he was on, and I turned around, he was behind me. He grabbed that pole where you put the uh, clothes on, you come in the cleaners, and you hang the people's clothes on while you're taking the money, and he started swinging at me with that pole. So I said, oh God. So my best cut was the upper cut down below. So I missed him, and all of a sudden, I had my arm down between his legs. I body slammed him. I said, hey, this is nice. He swung at me again, and I did the same thing. So he came back at me the third time. I threw him out the door with a glass window, and this guy named Norman Porter, he said, I had never seen anybody come out and bounce out, out on a sidewalk on the head. That's the first time I ever seen that. So Flaco, Flaco would see all the kids, and he would take their money, he would bully them. And a little boy named Diddy, Diddy told me, he was a little guy, he said, Gary, everything's all right now. If you can beat him with one arm, we sure can beat him with two. <laughs> <laughs> so bullying stopped around, around, around the uh, place. I stopped bullying around a couple of places because it, when I first came to Washington, the guy told me not to walk through his alley, to walk around on Second Street. And my mother said, what happened? I said, man, that guy jumped on me and knocked me down, you know. Said, uh, don't let me, te don't tell me about that again. So when I went back out there, old Dukey came up and he was telling, talking about what he was gonna do. And I hit him right there. And he, he was out and, and had no more problems, you know, out of Dukey. I could walk up the alley 
he would, he would turn his back when he saw me coming, you know. But I tell you, I had, I, I, I've uh, had quite a few fights. They jump on me, but they jumped off very quickly because I had some uncles that would fight. Oh, they would fight. If you call them N I G, you swallow G E R, you know. <laughs> and they, they, they didn't play it, you know. So some other magical thing happened to me. Uh, Jeannie Pridgen, uh, he lived in number one holler down the bottom. He didn't play with us. So I was coming, i just gotten run out of uh, Detroit, got put out for fighting. And uh, he said, get, Ian, get off of my ice. And he went and ran in the house. And them old screen doors, you know how they say, plop, plop. You know, they bounce, they have recoil. So this magical rock went between that flap and hit him in the nose. And I, I threw it from the creek back there. They went through the door and hit him in the nose. I swear, that was a magical rock, you know. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, uh, people come from Burnwell had all kind of jobs in uh, in Washington. I knew two brothers. They are the Lewis brothers, uh, Paul and Jerome. They worked at two theaters, the Mid City and the uh, Alamo. Man, the, every time the the uh, every time the movies uh, would, would change, I was there. And didn't I, I? I went to two or three other movies that I never had to pay because they knew me. And there was a girl named Mary Ann. You know how these big bags you get from the Safeway, the grocery store, the barrel bags? Go up there and she would fill it up full of popcorn. Then you go to another movie and eat the popcorn, you know? But Jerome, Jerome Lewis, and uh, they were from your, your family, Flake. Yeah, Mr. Lewis, yeah. What? Yeah. There was a one-handed pitcher named Jim Abbott who had a fascinating and very successful major league career. Yeah. He pitched a no-header. Did you follow his career with particular empathy and interest? No, I just know. I knew him. I watched him. You know, he it was, was fascinating good. to watch. Yeah, he was good. He was good. You know, but Pete Gray was the one that got me. Yeah, see, Pete Gray was a little skinny guy. He couldn't play. You know, he he the ball. He would change, throw the ball, and the glove would be there. He played outfield, but he, he lasted one year with the, with the Browns, you know. But I had a chance to go with uh, the Miami Marlins, and I went down to spring training, and I got there in March, and uh, I was supposed to meet Satchel Page down there in March, and Satchel Page didn't get there. He didn't even come there. He went on, to, went on and met the team. You know, he didn't go to spring training. He told me to meet him, but that, if you ever been up at a night with Satchel Page, God, those old guys would tell you some stories, I tell you. They, they, they had some stories to tell you. Satchel used to play here in Charleston yeah. in 1955. I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. When you had your accident, um, how, how did you get uh, medical attention? Well, it was, it, just like I said, you know, God has really looked out for me. If it wasn't for election day, and Mr. Pence was going to pick Grandma up and take her to uh, to vote, he happened to be standing outside the house. He was sitting outside the house waiting. So when I got my arm shot off, she ran out. They ran out and put me in the car. They had to take me to a little place called Man Mayhem, where Dr. Urban was. He put a tourniquet on and told him how to work the tourniquet. They, they had to drive 40, 40 some miles from Mahan to Charleston General, right here on Washington Street. And uh, they, uh, that's where I got medical attention. Dr. Swartz was the doctor's name. They cut my arm off. And I, it grew back in, when I was 13, I think it was. I had uh, Dr. Uh, Minikawa, and this was during the war in 45, yeah. Yeah, 40, you know, had a German doctor and a Japanese doctor. Yeah. But that's where I got my medical attention, right there. Yeah. I'm just, I was fascinated by the article. I was really, I want to know how you, I caught a little bit in Little League, but I want to know how you caught and were able to throw people out in the same well, ocean. What would you do? It was, it was nothing. It was just, 
flip, I'd flip the ball, flip the ball up, put the glove up here at the ball. See, like that. Mm -hmm. It was. Yeah. Right, flip it up. Right, right here. And and uh, catch the ball. You know what I would do? Um, guys would uh, be coming home, and they were going to tag them out. I would just wait till they got close, and uh, I would take the ball out of the glove. And you know I'd do it. I had done it so many times. I didn't even have to look. And uh, Maybe hit them in the mouth with it, you know, when they're coming down. But the other thing I didn't understand from the article: Are you still trying to complete a, a book and a movie? Yeah. And you're looking for help? Yes. Okay. I'm I'm on GoFundMe and I'm trying to uh, uh, get this book. I swear, I'm typing. I'm I'm doing my own story. Nobody can tell your story like you can. You know, like the Mr. Pence. If it wasn't for Mr. Pence, I would have been dead. Cause see, in Burnwell, there were no cars up there. Mr. Mr. Uh, Copley had a horse that worked the coal mines, you know, but it wasn't nothing, man. And my uncle got where he was gonna run with me, but where was he going, you know? But that, that Mr. Pence saved my life. Um, this time, uh, the uh, Green Carter is going to introduce uh, somebody else uh, from the uh, so this evening we have a visitor who is a friend for life with Gary Davis. And this is Mr. James Estes from Columbus, Ohio. And we're so happy that he came to be with you this evening. And he has something to present to you from the governor of West Virginia of which he will read to you and present to you today. Okay. And we're so happy to have had you. I can't say it in words. Well, thank you. I called Harry and told you I'd talk to you. <laughs> okay. I don't really know if I can read this tonight. He got me so nervous <laughs> waiting for him. But it was worth the wait. <laughs> well worth the wait. Uh, this is from the state of West Virginia, Earl Ray Tom Tomlin, governor. Whereas, Gary Mays was born on March 26, 1936 in Burnwell, West Virginia. And whereas, Gary Mays moved to the northeast section of Washington, D.C., and despite losing his left arm in a shooting accident, started playing baseball at the Logan Community Center, and whereas Gary Mays attended Armstrong Technical High School, where he excelled in baseball and basketball, and whereas Gary Mays attended the college of Idaho and went on to become a liquor store owner, cab, bus, and limousine driver. And whereas Gary Mays was building chairman for the DC chapter of Habitat, Habitat for Humanities, Humanity. owner of his own construction company, and is currently vice president of Armstrong Aluminum, uh, Aluminum. Aluminum Association. Aluminum. And whereas Gary Mays is an exceptional individual, his outstanding accomplishments have an ex excellent example to us all. Now, therefore, I, Ray, Earl Ray Tomlin, governor of the great state of West Virginia, do hereby, upon Gary, hereby bestow upon Gary Mays this certificate of recognition. This is for the, from the governor of the state of West Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we hope you all have enjoyed our program this evening. 
And we want to thank you over and over again for remaining and being so patient. I enjoyed it. I had a good time. And everybody was so patient and waiting. And I feel it was worth every minute of it. And I hadn't seen you for a long time. And I figured, oh, he won't know her. <laughs> And how happy he made us by telling us what all he has done. And there's even more to come. And we wish you the best of everything you do in the future. Well, thank and you. Please come back and see us again. Okay. And thank well, you all for coming this evening and being so kind and waiting for a lovely evening that we've had. Well, Safe trip home, everybody. Well, the, pic well, the pictures we, take, we took today you know, we're going to try to put them into the book. And, uh, but I, I swear, uh, every time they tell me something, but my wife said, uh, Don, I'm going to tell you about my aunt first, the one that, uh, Aunt Helen. Helen uh, was a cook. I mean, she was a cook. I, I, this was my, my lovely aunt, I tell you. She uh, told me, she said, uh, you know these numbers? I can't hit three. Now they got a thing I call a snake with six. She said, Gary, give me six numbers. I gave her six numbers, and they, she hit. And she was on Washington Street with a bottle of whiskey and a pocket full of money. And a guy came, Jim Coven, came over to the football field, and she said, man, there's a woman up there raising hell on Washington Street. She done hit the snake, and she's got the money and the liquor. She just, she was in the middle of Washington Street, raising sand. But see, Joe, Joe went, you know, the toe. Joe was called the toe at West Virginia State. He was Helen's brother, my aunt's brother. Nobody knew that. Well, I'll keep you up here all night. <laughs> <laughs>